start recording. All right, so hello and welcome to session five for Shulik and I Scorch. So today we're going to be doing some fun stuff. We're going to be talking about a bunch of different ways of developing websites, as well as talking about some uh, some fancy stuff called markup languages and sort of concepts of how to do templating and building up websites in a little bit of a different way than what we've looked at so far. So as usual, uh, information for the slides is on the website. And if you want the exercise files, they're there. There's no changes today. So everything's all the same. If you've uh, already downloaded the exercise files, you don't have to change anything. You're all good to go. <clears throat> okay. So getting started, we'll talk about the different parts of a site. So we've sort of covered what's called the front end. So essentially, when you're looking at a site and you're looking at how it works, um, the front end is basically everything that you kind of see. This is also sometimes called the client side, or this is sometimes just called the client. And so essentially, <clears throat> this would be like your JavaScript, your HTML, your CSS, all the stuff that actually loads up in your browser that you see. But then the question is, if that stuff's all loading, what's actually allowing you to load it? Like, obviously, you have to be able to get it from somewhere. So when you go to Google.ca, for example, you're getting an HTML page, you're getting all the CSS, all that stuff's coming down from somewhere. So how does this actually work? <clears throat> so that's where what's called the back end comes in, or sometimes called the host, sometimes called the server. It's called a couple of different things. But <clears throat> essentially, this is going to be the system that actually communicates with your computer at more of a lower level. And it will also typically be the system that handles things that your browser can't handle as well. Uh, so as an example, if you have something like Instagram, uh, it would be unfeasible to have like all of your images stored locally on your device. Because then if your phone's not online, when somebody tries to go to your Instagram page, they wouldn't be able to see it. So it's just kind of useless, right? So <clears throat> that's where a backend comes in. Essentially, it's the thing that kind of does the storage. It stores all of your information, and it often does things that are more computationally intensive. So if you need to process a video, for example, you're not going to be wanting to do that on like an iPhone 10. So, so um that's basically what a backend is for, is basically for doing a lot of the processing and for actually sending the network requests and doing everything that you kind of find. It doesn't really work very well in the browser. And so there's no actual rule of thumb for this. So lots of things can be implemented in the front end or the back end. So there's no like hard and fast rule of, you know, specifically what's going to be on which side of it. Generally speaking, when you hear us talking about it for the duration of the rest of the sessions, what you'll find is that when we say backend, we mean whatever is going to be processed in Flask, which we'll talk about a little bit later on, or what's going to be processed in EasyCV, which we'll talk about later on in this session. Um, and then everything else is going to be front end for all intents and purposes. <clears throat> Okay, and so that leads us into different ways of developing a site. And so there's tons of different categories of how you can build out a site. And typically they're divided up by how much backend versus front end there are in a site. Um, again, this isn't like a hard and fast rule. This is just a useful tool that we're gonna be using throughout the sessions to sort of describe sites. So static is gonna be the first one. And essentially what this is, is basically you have your HTML, your CSS and your JavaScript. And the only thing your backend does is serve those files. So if somebody, asks your server for the files, it gets those files and it sends them back to them. It doesn't care about anything else, doesn't need to store anything else, doesn't need to have any other data. It's literally just a glorified share that you'd find. It's like basically like a fancier way of like clicking in a thumb drive and getting somebody to open the files, right? Um, <clears throat> this advantage to this is that it's usually super cheap, mostly for the most part free. We're actually going to be showing you next time how to host a site for free using this method. Um, and they're usually the easiest to set up as well. So there's usually not really much overhead. You don't really have to maintain anything. Typically it's just Check out the files, the files either one or they don't. So um, on the complete opposite end of the spectrum is dynamic sites, web apps, and CMSs. And so dynamic sites is basically just that everything is typically handled by the back end, and the front end is only responsible for just sort of showing stuff. So as kind of a rough example, if we imagine that we had kind of a server, every time we go to the server, we need like a like a an item, for example. This might be something that we'd see in the back end where we'd have like this, this is just in JavaScript where we have like, for example, a function that's getting the price, the item name and the description, possibly from a database somewhere. And then this is what gets sent back to the user. So this is what they see on the page, right? All of that transaction, everything that's happening and even the HTML itself that's being generated is all being generated by the back end server and then sent to the front end server. And so this kind of dynamic HTML generation is typically the way that 99% of backends will work. So if you're using JavaScript libraries, like if you're using React or if you're using anything like Next.js or anything that you're using in the JavaScript side of things, if you're in Python and you're using something like Flask or Django that people will talk about, or if you're in at a Rust using Rust Rocket, Go using any of the ones that are there, any language you're looking at, typically speaking, it will be something like this, where you're going to have a backend that's generating the HTML and then firing it off to you. <clears throat> and so the dynamic sites essentially Every single page just gets requested, some sort of functions being run to, in order to generate that page and send it back to you. Um, CMSs are another type of dynamic site. These are very specific types of sites that essentially they're designed to help people build websites. 
Um, specifically, usually it's a blog. So you can see here that kind of there's like these pages that you can create where you have like you can enter in your content. There's different types of editors. You can see the WYSIWYG stuff that we were talking about last time. Essentially, these are mostly used for creating content. So they're called content management systems. They're basically designed for, you know, if you are somebody working at the Washington Post, for example, you would have a CMS system behind the scenes that you go ahead and you type up your stories into. And then that's what you submit to get it published on the front page. You're, you know, people who are journalists aren't going to be writing the HTML behind every web page that they're going to be submitting. So um, this would be sort of what a CMS is for. <clears throat> On the other side of things, web apps are a little bit more complicated. Uh, web apps is basically sort of anything else that just has a web interface. So here we have a server management system called Yacht that I'm just showing off here. Uh, this literally manages an entire like infrastructure setup that I have at my house. And so this is all done inside the browser on like what's something that is considered to be a website, but it's entirely basically like an application. So same sort of application that you'd find that you'd install on your phone or anything like that is kind of running in basically a browser. And these can be significantly more complicated than a typical website that you'd find. Um, there is another category that I did want to mention, which is a uh, highly specified sort of backends. So the one that I want to specifically mention is one called Gradio that I'll talk about. Um, I just found this recently. I've been messing around with large language models a lot and generative AI. Um, this is all in Python. So you can see here down here, there's some Python code that you have right here. And what this is basically designed for is it's designed to do the exact same thing where it generates a bunch of HTML for you, but it also does it specifically so that you can interact with AI models really easily. So you install Gradio, this is the code that you see right here. And then basically when you type in stuff, it's gonna go ahead and it's gonna to talk to you with language models essentially from there. So there's also, that's a kind of a new thing that's coming up that's more getting more popular is having specifically designed um, systems and frameworks that are built around a specific use case. Okay, so uh, I did not open Top Hat. Give me two seconds to quickly open Top Hat while I talk about this one. So, um, Essentially, the quick question is, if you work at a news company, so let's imagine that you work at a news company, and the site lets you log in, lets you create an article, lets you submit it to be reviewed, and uh, it's approved, and then you'll see it sort of show up tomorrow, right? Which of these parts are the front end, and which parts are going to be the back end? And you're going to get extra time to do this question, because I did not sign into Top Hat, so I have to sign everything back in, so i got to find all the information for that. Two seconds here. I to resume the recording, so I'll resume it from here. Um, but yes, the answer in that case was just that you can kind of get an idea, but you're not entirely sure. So it would have been E in that case. <clears throat> okay. So static site generators. This is probably my favorite way of building out websites. It's essentially right in the middle. So the idea is that basically there are other languages besides HTML that are nicer to work with. <clears throat> and there's other formats that are nicer to work with as well. So as you start developing things, what you'll realize is no matter how good you think your interface is, oftentimes there's some people that just know how to do one thing and they just want to stick with whatever that thing is. Maybe it's they know how to make a spreadsheet and they, they, you know, they've been managing their entire inventory system in a spreadsheet and that's all they want to do and that's all they want to keep doing. So then sometimes you have to go around and develop around using a spreadsheet, which kind of sucks. Um, <clears throat> and so the idea with static site generators is basically this. You take, okay, the Wrong side. But you take essentially some sort of a input format data, whatever the format is that the person who's using it kind of likes. So maybe it's a spreadsheet, maybe it's uh, like a Word doc, maybe it's like a PDF, maybe it's something else. Uh, I would recommend affording PDF and Word docs just because they're much harder to work with. Um, <clears throat> but it can be basically any format. It can even be a PowerPoint presentation if you really want to. Uh, and you take that information and essentially whatever information is contained inside of that sort of document, <clears throat> you take that and you use what's called a template, which is basically like some sort of HTML that will fill in sort of the variables like we've seen before with uh, this example where we have kind of like, you know, these values are being passed in. So we might, for example, get these values from a spreadsheet instead. And then what we do is we use that to generate HTML at the end. And then we sort of export those files out. And then we have a static site that runs as fast as a static site does. So we don't have to wait for it to generate every time. But we also have the ability to go back and easily modify whatever we want to be able to regenerate the sites as we go. So it's a nice, like right in the middle sort of option. <clears throat> And so there is a slide, there's a slide here that kind of gives you a good idea of when to use each. So if you're using, if you got like one to three people who are pretty technical, need low maintenance as possible, stack site might be a good idea. If you have sort of intermediate, you have a team of like less than 10 people sort of thing. And there's people who are kind of technical, but not really. Um, and you kind of only make changes like every month or like a weekish, something like that. And that's not too bad. Uh, dynamic is kind of like, if you're going to be making changes like consistently, you know, you're going to be changing things every other day, then after a while, static site generators start to lose their sort of lose their steam because you're constantly regenerating things. So it does get a bit slower over time. Uh, typically, it doesn't really matter. I've used stack site generators that have like thousands of files and they're perfectly fine. But if you're somebody like 
again, the Washington Post, for example, you know, you might have like 50,000 stories. At that point, processing 50,000 files every time you want to have a new article being published is a little bit much. So uh, there's some resources that I've left here for specifically for front end, back ends, and then mixes of both. So if you're interested in learning more about one or the other, you can take a look at that. And so um, when we're talking about sort of the static dynamic and the static set generator based sites, what were kind of the main things that were the differentiation? So let me just quickly pop open that question. Question two, sorry, they're in reverse order for me. So I'm just going back to grab it. So there we go. You got two minutes to give that a whirl. And again, I'm sorry, they're very long. There we go. Um, so in this case, it's going to be, the answer is going to be B. So it's going to be, it tells you how the content changes happen. So static is basically, like I said before, it's just plain code files. So you're going to upload the code. That's how you're going to change it. Um, dynamic is basically you have some sort of server you have to make changes with. <clears throat> and then um, static, uh, where's the next site? Static generators. That question is miswritten there. Um, okay. We, I'll have to take a look at that one. Uh, we might have to change around some of the markdown on that one just because I can see here, I think that, was, uh, that just has the wrong text in there. So I'll get that sorted out. We'll probably have to take a look at that. Um, okay, perfect. So markup languages. We've actually already looked at some of these. So HTML, which is what we've been working with the whole time, is what's called a markup language. And so essentially all that this means, this is just a nice fancy way of basically saying that it's a language that tells you how to, how to display something. So with HTML, we're not really doing any data processing. We're not doing any sort of like fancy math inside of the HTML stuff. Um, we're just looking at what, what is it supposed to look like essentially, right? <clears throat> and so that's what markup languages convey is what a, what's called a renderer should process. So essentially it's like, I want this large piece of text. So I'm going to say, give it an H1, have it show up like that, right? What this means is that we can take other formats that are easier to work with and we can convert them into HTML. So this is what's called Markdown, which is supposed to be very human readable. So essentially one hash here is an H1, two hashes would be an H2, three hashes would be an H3, et cetera. Uh, in um, documents, so when you're working with Microsoft Word, this is follows the ODF standard and this is what it kind of looks like, which of course Microsoft does make it more difficult than everybody else. So you can see here, it has all this information around it, but that's basically what you see whenever you actually work directly with something like uh, a Microsoft document. And so <clears throat> there's two kind of mark, there's kind of two languages that we're going to cover today that are super handy. And what they'll allow you to do is you can essentially have something like, for example, let's say a blog or some other sort of post that you can have people be able to access and be able to edit really easily while still being able to work with stuff in there. So Markdown is super simple. It's easy to read. The whole point of Markdown is basically that you can you can read it. You can just basically look at it. You can understand it. Even if you don't have it rendered a lot of times, you can kind of understand what's going on if you know what things are supposed to look like. And so um, if we're taking a look at something like VS Code, for example, if we have a markdown file, we can go ahead and we can actually open it up and hold Control Shift V and it'll actually open for us. So I believe, I think this is just, I was in a different file, but yeah. So for example, here is the markdown file that's the readme for the Shulkin Knight website. <clears throat> and so when I'm looking at this, I'm in a readme.md, which is for dot markdown. If I go ahead and hit control shift and then V, it'll open up the preview here. Or I can hit control or command P, and then I can go ahead and I can hit a little angle like that to say that I want to run some sort of a command. And I can say markdown preview to one, there's a markdown preview. And I can say open preview like that. And it will show me it there. So essentially, this is the source sort of stuff where we have the one hash here, the two hashes here. And you can see now we have heading one, heading two. We have bullet points that are just bullet points, et cetera. So super easy to use. I would highly recommend learning Markdown. It's not only useful for doing web development. Uh, I use it for my note taking. I use it for a whole bunch of other things. Super handy to learn. So um, Markdown has a ton of tags, similar to HTML. Uh, but basically, the super simple, the basic ones are you have headings. Like I said before, you have the hash, and then how many hashes you had is how many like heading levels deep you are. So H1 would be one hash, two hashes would be H3, or H2, three would be three, et cetera. <clears throat> and even more complicated tags get easier. So unordered lists, for example, are literally just you put a hyphen and then space, and then you do whatever you want after that, essentially. So there's a syntax sheet available here. I'll send this in the chat as well, just so that people can start looking at it if they are interested. Uh, but basically, it's pretty simple. We're not going to do anything wild today. Um, 
very simple tech stuff. Um, but yeah, you can see here kind of what it looks like. We have the markdown on the left, we have the HTML in the middle, and then we have what it looks like on the right-hand side. So if we go down to like, uh, I don't know, block quotes is another common thing that pops up where you have this nice little thing that shows up for a quote. This is literally just a greater than sign in there. And then you just put your text. So um, lots of really cool stuff. If you want to do code snippets, like we saw before with highlight, you can do that directly in here as well by just using a couple of back ticks and then you're good to go. So, um, okay. And if you do end up having things that you do want to show that aren't part of the markdown specification, you can just put HTML in here as well. So any markdown parser uh, that works properly will allow you to also put in whatever tags you want from HTML as well. Um, there's also a uh, extension you can install called Markdown All in One that lets you kind of cheat and makes it a bit faster. So you can hold things like, for example, hold Control B or Control I, and it'll do bolding and italicizing if you want to do that as well. That's just in. If you go to extensions, and then you just type in Markdown All in One, should be the top results right here, and you can install that, and that'll let you have those uh, keyboard shortcuts if you want them. Okay. So yeah, so like I was saying before, you can have a situation where you can convert between these different formats. So this would be the markdown on the left-hand side here, which is equivalent to this uh, HTML, which is equivalent to this ODF over here. So information is information, and however it's supposed to be displayed is how it's supposed to be displayed. So you can go back and forth between any of them as you want. <clears throat> okay, so using that syntax guide that I sent in the chats, we're going to give you guys a chance. So essentially, there will be this markdown on the left-hand side here. And on the right-hand side, basically, you're going to pick which one you think it corresponds to. So we'll give you guys a chance to try that out. So let me just quickly go up the top hat and open up that question. OK, and I'll put it up there. And since it's visual, I'll just minimize this down here. but. Yeah, basically you guys get however long is on that timer. Two minutes there. Try that out. Recording. So let's actually pop open the markdown syntax guide and we'll try and figure this out. So this first one we already know because we talked about it earlier, which is going to be an H1, uh, which doesn't really help us that much because everything has an H1 in here. Uh, now, one kind of thing you can kind of do to cheat is you can see here that everything in red is actually a real HTML element. So this one for A is kind of off the bat immediately. And then from there, the question is, okay, well, what, what do these, what do these asterisks actually do essentially, right? And so we can go ahead and we can go take a look at this. And if we go and we take a look at uh, in here, there should be some information about the asterisk. So if I go ahead and control F, type in an asterisk, let's see what we find here. So we have a bunch of items for lists, but that has to be inside of something else. Okay, so then where else do we have? We take a look in here, we have bold and italics. So essentially when we look at this, we can see here, okay, well, if this has three, then it's bold and italicized. Uh, and then if we have something like italics, they're in singles. And then if we have um, bold, they're in doubles. So essentially any doubles will be bold, any singles will be uh, a single asterisk. And it'll tell you uh, on this side that like it has the EM here and it has strong here. Okay, so then we go back and look. Then we see here, okay, so we have strong and we have EM here. So the only one that has that is C. And then the rest of this all matches up as well. So the answer in this case is going to be C. Okay. Yeah, well, basically, as far as you're concerned, this is just going to be like JSON, except for it's just you don't include the squiggly braces. It's basically all this is. So when we're looking at YAML, essentially all that it's there for is to do key value pairs like we've seen before in JSON. Uh, it's just a little bit fat. It's just a little bit easier to write. That's basically the only difference between it. So <clears throat> when we're looking at something like this, for example, we can see here we have name corresponds to Kieran. So if we went to in this YAML file, we had whatever the file name was, and then we looked for a name, we have the key, we have a value, and that's what we get. And then the comments are using use the hash. So basically everything after this is a comment. And then that's it. Basically, that's all how YAML works. So if we want to do like lists, we can do them like this, where we just have the um, hyphens, or we can do them kind of in this array style right here. We also have the option of having objects. So you can see here we have a websites object, which then has a portfolio object, which then has URL. This is exactly the same as what you'd find in JSON, except for we can also expand it out to make it look like this. It's really just the exact same thing as JSON, just a little bit different, essentially. And the reason why this matters at all for us and why we actually care about it is because basically for Markdown, if we want to, we can include information at the top of the um, page. So let's say, for example, we had something like a blog post and maybe we have two different styles. Maybe we have like one style that's for Christmas, one style that's for fall or something like that that we want to include. We could basically have a YAML thing at the very beginning that says, you know, Christmas true or 
winter false or whatever we want to include at the top there. So it basically just lets us include some extra information with our markdown files as we're going. So uh, this one's going to be a bit of a longer one as well. I apologize again. Um, <clears throat> we're looking at these essentially. What is the information that's being presented? So let me just quickly grab question four and present it. And then after this, I promise we'll start getting into the coding. These ones are super long, so just check them in the actual um, uh, the actual top app. So yeah, so essentially, basically, and when you have these, so when you put the F there, and then you put three of these strings. If people aren't used to this, if you do have double quotes or single quotes, this will let you do a multi-line string, which is why we can see that this string kind of goes across multiple lines here. And then yeah, and then the F is what actually allows you to have the variables in there. If you don't put the F there, you'll just literally get squiggly brace name. You won't actually get any variables put in there. But <clears throat> this is what we're going to use. This is what will typically be called the template. So we have the data, which will be pulled typically from the file. So this might be like a markdown file that we'd get this information from, or like an Excel spreadsheet or something like that. And then that will be put into the template, which we can see right here. And then that will be piped out to, at the end, HTML, CSS, JavaScript files. Uh, some other examples of code generation. So Emmets is the system that we've been using for a bunch of stuff. There's a bunch of other ones. Scratch, people are familiar with that. Whole bunch of things. So what we're going to do today is we're going to be using Python, and we're going to be using it to generate websites entirely using sort of Python backend, and then use that to generate a static site through a static site generator. And so to do that, we're going to be using Jinja. And so Jinja basically does exactly what we were just talking about there, where we have the sort of the F string, and then we put variables in there. It just does that more fancy and much faster. Um, so essentially what you do is you have what's called an environment, which then loads your templates through a loader, and then you actually go through and use a template to render itself. So there's four steps to doing this. We basically bring in the package, uh, we set up the environment, we load a template, and then we render the template with data. <clears throat> so before we can actually get this done, when we go to the breakout rooms for the exercise that's coming up in a second here, you're going to have to run pip install Jinja 2, or if you're on Mac or Linux, you're going to have to run sudo pip 3 install Jinja 2, and your mentors should be able to help you with that if you need that. So this is what the code would actually look like. So we're going to go from Jinja 2, which is the package that we're using. We're going to grab an environment, and then this thing called a select auto escape here. And what this is going to do is we're going to say, okay, we're going to create the environment, which is basically going to hold all of our information that we have about our system. And then from there, we're going to go ahead and we're going to load some template. In this case, we're going to load it from the environment as a string. So we're going to import a string like this, and then it's going to go through and it'll insert all the variables that we want by using template.render. <clears throat> so at this point where we say load a template, we're actually going to load, this is going to load a template uh, object into example template. And then from there, when we do render, we tell it what each of the variables are going to be. So at this point, it's all just plain text, and that's what the template is going to be read in as. And then down here, when we execute the template and we hit render, we're going to assign each of those variables the names that they need to be inside here. Your mentors can also help you with this if this doesn't make sense as well. And so if we want to load files instead, then what we do is we also add in this, what's called a loader, which is a file system loader. We tell it what folder the templates are going to be in, and then we tell it what the, what the file is called that we want to load. So if we have a folder called templates and it has a file called index.jinja in it, then that's basically where we would load this file system loader. We tell it to go to templates and then we tell it to go to index.jinja to get the template. And then we do the same thing that we did before. So your environment kind of houses everything that you need. And then from there you get your template, and then you have your template rendered with whatever information you need. So yeah, so this would be, this could be an example of what our template looks like in slash templates index.jinja and then that would get pulled in. And then with this right here, we would go ahead and render it and we'd set those variables up. Okay. So Jinja can take in basically any type of object that you want, and you can also access any of the methods that are available on an object as well. So if an object has something like a, like a dot printable or something like that, where it returns like a version of itself, that's easier to read. Um, you can also access that directly inside here as well. Uh, it doesn't care what type they are. At the end, it will try to convert everything into a string. So if you have an integer, it'll try and convert that to a string. If you have uh, a floating point, it'll try and convert that to a string. If you have a regular object, it'll try and convert that to a string. It will try to convert literally everything it can into a string. And then um, if it can't, then it'll run into an error. So just keep that in mind. So just make sure that everything that you're using can be kind of converted to a string. So you can see here, like for example, if we had a dictionary, so let's say we had a, a config file here that had a name variable and then Kieran uh, as like the uh, as the value. 
then we can go ahead and we can access the config name the exact same way that we would with Python, basically. So once we enter these two double squiggly braces here, we're basically saying, hey, this is going to be a variable that I'm going to use, and this is what I want to do with it. Right. And then let's say we have a date time object. We can also access the attributes that are on there. So this object has a thing called date.year, and we can access that directly inside here. So anything we want, we can put inside there, basically. <clears throat> as long as it's inside those double scripty braces, it'll be considered to be a variable, which it'll try and load once you hit render here. Um, you can also do functions and filters. So this is basically, uh, you can kind of use this pipe. And what you can do is it'll basically take name and it'll pass it to this function. So there'll be a function in the back end called capitalize, and then you're passing name to capitalize, essentially. So it's in backwards order from what you used to with functions. So what this will do is, well, in this case, it'll capitalize it. So if your name is there, it'll make sure that it's capitalized the whole way through super simple um there's tons of other filters that you can use and tons of other ways you can access stuff um there's a couple of useful ones they're all linked here if you're interested um the main one that you're going to care about is going to be safe and so what this does is when you open strings so like we talked about last time with escaping and all that sort of stuff um you have to specifically say that you want something to load as html or you want it to be escaped by default it is escaped so by default it will not load html if you want it to load as html you have to say that it's safe and then it will load as HTML. So just keep that in mind when you're going through this stuff. Uh, you can do other things as well. So in your templates, you can do loops. So if somebody gave you a spreadsheet, for example, and you had a table, you could loop through all the data in the spreadsheet and then fill out the entire table if you wanted to. Um, the only thing that's kind of weird compared to regular Python is that you have to use these percentage signs to say that you're going to do, so you do one squiggly brace instead of two, and then you do a percent sign, and then you can put whatever sort of thing you want in there. That works for if statements as well. So if, else, elif, all that sort of stuff, you can do them in kind of like a, in, in an order. The only thing is that you have to tell it when it's going to end. So you have to explicitly say, hey, I'm ending this here. So in this case, for this for loop, I have to say end for right here. And that will end my for loop. If I was doing an if statement, I could have if and then whatever here, and then I could have else if, el whatever. And then at the end of it, I have to say end if at the end of it. So I have to explicitly tell it that I'm ending whatever I'm saying as a statement. Um, this is kind of cool as well. When you're doing loops, there's a bunch of variables you can access. So if you want to know what index you're on, you can just get loop.index. There's a whole bunch of stuff built in. It's kind of fancy. So you can take a look at that if you, that's useful for you. You can also have it display something different for the first thing by checking loop.first, and loop.first will be a Boolean. So you can pass this into whatever you want to check. So yeah, this is what I was talking about before. We can say if age is greater than 23, for example, then you can have base show up. Else you can say less base, and then you can have end if at the end of it to make sure that you end the actual if statements um, in order. You can also set variables. I wouldn't recommend doing this, but you can do it if you really want to. This is mostly useful for really more complicated things, but probably you should set all your variables before you get to the template. Uh, if you're setting variables in the template, usually you're doing something really complicated. So just be careful with that. Okay, so first exercise is going to be, we have some files inside the exercises slash teams folder. And what we're going to do here is basically we're going to add support for three column layouts for each of the team members. And so to actually build this, when you actually want to see what the HTML output is. So if we go ahead and click on this just to see what the code kind of looks like, uh, you can see here we have export.py and then we have index.ginger. So index.ginger is going to be our template. So we can see here it's kind of just a bootstrap stuff and it has some to-dos in there for you to take a look at. And then inside export.py, we can see here we have a dictionary that has some information about each of the people. And we're going to want to basically put that through. Um, and have it show up on on there and in order to actually see the html at the end of it you have to run python export.py and then that'll give you the html files at the end so give you guys a chance to give that a roll so um for that last one so if we take a look at what we had beforehand um so in here we kind of have this to do message and then the initial code if you can see here we kind of have these variables that's really that's probably really small in your second guys so one second let me make this bigger um so initially, we kind of have this column large 12, so it's taking up the whole screen sort of thing. And then we have information here where we have team members, zero image, whatever. Okay. So then if we go back to our actual export file here where we're exporting our data, we can see here, okay, so there's a team members list. And then in that team members list, we're getting the zero with elements, and then we're getting the information out of it. Okay. So at that point, essentially what we're looking for is we're going to need to do a iteration. So we can do four members in team members, which is the information that we're passing in. And then with that, we're going to change this card. Instead of having it be large 12, we're going to make it large four so that it only takes up a third of the page as we go. And then we just basically say, since we're going through each of the members, we just get the member's specific image, name, description, whatever, right? So instead of doing member zero, in this case, we're just replacing all of this with that iteration where we're replacing each member as we go, basically. 
And so obviously this is super helpful for situations where, you know, you might have some company that has like a hundred products you don't want to be going through and doing, you know, product zero, product one, product two, whatever, right? We can just kind of have these templates that build themselves out as we go and then update as we add more content. Okay, let's grab that, grab that. There we are, okay. So um, another place this is super helpful with, and this is like a really, this is the thing that you should get used to doing, especially is saving yourself time with using what are called partials. So essentially you can use what's called the extends and blocks keywords. And what these allow you to do is those components that we've been talking about where we have the components and then we kind of have like the information, we can actually use those in this system. So we can create, for example, a card component, and then we can fill it with different data depending on what we need for each situation. And we can just literally have that be set up for us. So let's say, for example, we have something like base.html. So this would be like kind of our base main thing. This is going to be stuff that doesn't change. So we might have something like this where we have like our, our head, our CSS, all of our stuff in here, like our JavaScript files that we're going to be importing. And then we can have something like this where we say block main and then block title. And what we're going to do in each of our sort of um, different pages that we have, we have like an about page or a contact page. We're going to override each of these two blocks. We're going to override title and we're going to override main and they're going to get injected into here, essentially. And then from there, so let's say, for example, we have like an about page or this would be the home page, I guess. We can say it extends base.html. So it extends this page that we're looking at here. And then we say for the title, we're going to have home page, which will basically take this home page thing right here. It's going to inject it in between where it shows up right here. And then we have main, and then we have some HTML inside here. And then that's going to get injected in here. So especially with Bootstrap, for example, this is going to be super handy because it means that you don't your entire like Bootstrap pages might literally be you know twenty lines of HTML because everything else is in your base template. And then so essentially you have your base that uh, your base on Ginger in this case uh, instead of HTML, and it's going to define your main block, your title block, which get overridden, and then index.ginger, which might be like the home page, is going to inherit your nav, your footer, etc. from the base, and then it's going to replace it and override the new content of these two blocks inside index.html. And then we can also include what are called partials, which are basically like little snippets of code that we can reuse wherever we want. So we might have something like a card, for example, that might be used inside product.ginger, so like a product page. It might also be used on index.ginger. It might be used on literally every single page of the site, for example, it might be used on, right? And so basically we can just make those components. And then from those components, we can have those be copied in to different places. And so this is kind of the way that you can have like a sort of boring partial where you might have something like boring card.ginger, which kind of has my text, my, my title, whatever, all that sort of stuff. This is hard coded sort of HTML. And then we could say include boring card.ginger. And that's going to basically replace this statement here when it goes through and creates the HTML. It's going to replace that with this HTML that we have here. Useful, but the question is, okay, how do we actually put stuff into it? How do we actually put information into it? <clears throat> and that's where we can basically include variables. So we can say, for example, we have a Bootstrap 5 card here. We have an image, we have title, we have a text. So now when we go through and we define this in other templates, we can go ahead and we can pass them in like functions. So for example, we can say with title equal doggo, image equals whatever image dot slash doggo, and then text equals woof. We can include card.ginger, and then it'll pass these variables into card.ginger and it'll show up for us. So we can do this. And that means that we can have, for example, three cards show up that have different information, but are all using the same card.ginger HTML, for example. So all that stuff is going to be copied across and it's going to go through there. Um, Jinja can be used in other languages as well. I have also had contracts that have used the Java version of Jinja, for example, uh, for enterprise stuff. There is, I've seen Rust and Dart being used as well. And there's also Jinja.js, but I wouldn't use this. I would actually use uh, Nunjux or Mustache, which is what we have here listed. And there's tons of other templating languages and other sort of um, templating language systems that are used here. And so this is where we get to static site generators officially, which is basically doing everything that we've talked about up until now, except for with a lot of them, you have pre-built templates, which is very nice, which is what we're going to be using for some of this stuff. <clears throat> so we have our source files, we pass them into our template files, and then we get kind of our output files from there. So let's say, for example, we have some source files. Let's say we have a configuration.yaml file, which has some information about our website. We then have a post like this where we're saying, hey, I want a dark theme. And then inside of our template files, we have, okay, config, we want to get the person's name. And then we can say, if we're recruiting, which we're pulling from this config right here, then we can check it in there. And then we can say for each of the pages in the markdown files, uh, if the page has a theme of dark, change the background color. And if not, don't worry about it, right? And then at the end, we end up with whatever the final output HTML file is. Uh, if you want to do it from scratch, here's how you can do it. I wouldn't 
you're not going to need to because we're going to be using a system for this. But if you want to know how it works, this is how you do it from scratch. The system that we're going to be using is what's called EasyCV. And so this is basically a purpose-built static site generator for building personal websites, essentially. And so it takes in markdown files, it takes in YAML config files, and it lets you build out a static site, essentially. <clears throat> and so if you weren't here for session zero, then you'll have to install this. Essentially, just go to your terminal and just do the same thing you did for Ginger. So you can do pip install and then easy CV. If you installed it during session zero, you will need to do pip install and then you have to do dash dash upgrade and then easy CV. There was a patch that I pushed forward literally today. So dash dash upgrade if you need to. Um, and that patch just fixed one of the issues that was in the system there. So um, yeah, make sure you install it and then we can get started with actually using it. <clears throat> so we're not going to cover a bunch of the features. We're going to cover just the basics so you can see kind of the idea. If you're interested in a bunch of that stuff, the documentation is available and you can read all of how the stuff works and it'll give you instructions on how to like create your own themes and stuff as well. But to initialize the site, we basically do easy CV init. So I'm looking in, for example, so if I just go back to, uh, let's go back to the desktop and I go easy CV and it's Kieran, this is an example here. Then there was a site that was created at this location here. So if I go ahead and I pop up my desktop and I go into Kieran, we can see here it created a whole bunch of files for me. Great. Now, if I go ahead and I go into that directory, I can go ahead and I can do ezcv-p, for example, and we already have a working site up and running that I can just start modifying. So all this stuff's already pre-included for you. And then from here, we can go ahead and we start modifying stuff. <clears throat> So if you leave, you can change that around the name. So if you want to use both like your, your first name and your last name, for example, then you want to include it in quotes. So you'd want to do ECCB and it's, and then for example, like if I want to include my full name, I would do Kieran Wood like that. And then if you know what theme you want, there's a bunch of themes available in here if you're interested. If you know what theme you want and you like out of these ones, you can just put the theme name afterwards as well and it'll set that up for you as well. Okay, so now that we kind of have that, um, we can do configuration. So like I was saying before, YAML is a great way of doing it. So we have a config.yaml file. If I go ahead and pop this open, uh, open it up, we can see here, this is what our stuff looks like from by default. So we're saying, hey, we have our name, we have our theme, and then we have this resume variable, which we'll talk about in a bit. And then we have biography, which is like a description about me. If I go ahead and take a look at the site, I can see here, I have my information in here. And if I go to about, I can see a description about yourself. So that's being pulled from this YAML, that YAML config file basically that script that biography thing right here is being pulled directly into here and so with that what it means is that if i want to change any variables around i can just change those variables and we're good to go um so the theme key has a lookup order there's information from there it'll download stuff after the fact if you don't have it available for you so if you didn't if you haven't previously ever used any of these themes it'll have to download them the first time um, but once they're downloaded you can actually go ahead and uh this first one, it'll override it if it sees something in your folder that you're currently working in that has the same name. So for example, the main theme is called dimension inside of um, inside of the system. If I were to go ahead and create a folder called dimension in here, it would check inside that folder first before it would go to the folder that's saved somewhere else. So what that means is that we can actually copy our theme and start working on it. So if I went ahead and I said easy CV and then it's theme dash C, what that's gonna do is that's gonna go ahead and that's gonna copy a folder into here that we can see called dimension. And this includes, this is basically our entire website right here. So this is all of our theme. This is all of our templates. So if I go ahead and pop this open, for example, uh, that opened in a different code window. Where did that code window go? Sorry, I have like 11 windows open right now. Just trying to find the right one. There we go. Okay, we'll just take a look at it in here. We can see here, this is what it looks like. So we have config name in here. This is basically just a regular Jinja template. So everything's already been built out for you. And we can just go ahead and we can modify it as we want. And so with our steps that we talked about before, essentially it'll go through, use that template, generate the information based on our files, and then it'll go ahead and it'll chuck them into a bunch of output files for us. Um, it enforces this using its structure in ECCV. So inside of the content folder for whatever you set up, all that information will be in there. And um, nothing will show up for you with those examples unless you set examples to be true. So currently examples by default is false. If you set examples to be true, then all this example content that's inside here will show up. But if you don't want it to show up, just leave examples as false. Um, and so the way that this system actually builds itself out is there are what are called sections. So <clears throat> when we're looking at something like this, for example, if we take a look at, let's say education, so we can see here, we have inside that folder that got created, we have content, 
and then we have education. If we go back into our dimension, which is our theme, and then we go into sections, you can see here we have education. So all of the content that is uh, under education will be rendered using this education.ginger file. So if I go ahead and open that in Visual Studio Code, then we can see here, this is what it's gonna pull out. And if I were to take a look at the content that is inside of here, and I were to take a look at education, for example, and pull it up and then put them side by side, you can see here, okay, for a uh, specific experience in education, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna get the institution, which is right here. We're gonna go ahead and we're gonna get the month started. Uh, which doesn't show up here, so it's not going to show up. Uh, oh, there we go. So if experience title is there, then we're going to go ahead and we're going to put a title there. And then if there's something else there, then we're going to put all that information there. And then if we have content, which is going to be this right here, then we're going to go ahead and make sure that it's rendered as safe. So it's going to show up as HTML, essentially. And if you ever forget how this works, when you're looking at, so like, with this last slide here. So we can see here, we have to say that it's also safe for that specific specific section. Um, so like, for example, with the work experience section, we have to say work experience underscore HTML and then make sure that it's safe in our main template. Um, then it'll eventually come out to something like this. <clears throat> but if you want to create a section, you just say easy CV section. And then from there, essentially everything that you need should be in the command line. So if you go ahead and type in easy CV in your command line uh, and you spell it right, then you should get information about what you can do with everything as well, if you do have questions. Okay, this gets generated for you when you run section command. So we don't need to memorize this. It, this stuff is all going to be available for you if you run that section command. So just run that command and it'll generate it for you. So what we're going to care about now instead is there is a easy CV site that's been set up for you under exercises slash section underscore theme. And with that section, what you're going to want to do is generate a new section and uh, then go ahead and add that in there. So generate some sort of new section, add it to somewhere on the page and give that a shot. So we'll give guys a chance to try that out. In, okay. So with this now, if you want to use configuration variables, you can basically just do config and then whatever the key is. So when we're taking a look at something like, for example, in the config.yaml file in here, um, let's say we wanted to add something, <clears throat> let's say for example, that we want to add something like dark, right? So we wanted to say dark, if we want to include a dark theme, if I just do dark here, and then I said false, would that work? Give it a couple of seconds. If you don't know, you can always, you can always guess. No takers? Yep. So yes, this would work. Um, so the big thing with doing something like this that's super handy about having a config.yaml file is that you don't have to change any code in order to put new variables in. So if you want to track new information in here, you can just add it and you don't have to worry about having to um, like change stuff around basically. There's no, you don't have to change around all the time. Like you, if you want to add in some sort of a feature for the template, then that feature gets added in and then you don't have to push any actual code updates to easy CV in order for it to work. You basically just modify your template and then people can just chuck it in their config variable. So super easy to do. Whereas with other sort of systems where you're using something like a WordPress or like a CMS system that we saw before, adding something like a config value like this would be a whole process. It'd be like a database migration. It'd be a whole bunch of like, it'd be five or six steps just to add in a new variable basically. So systems like this are really nice for super small um, websites like this. Uh, if you screw something up, it'll yell at you. Uh, it'll tell you what you're missing. It'll tell you what type it needs to be. And it'll tell you what it needs to do. So if you forget, for example, the biography um, value, then it'll tell you, hey, you need biography and then you need to put the information in there and it has to be a type string. And then it'll tell you what it does. This field's for writing by yourself and you can use that to have multiple lines. So please add this to your, your YAML file. So if you ever screw anything up, it'll tell you. Uh, there's information about filters. You can also write your own filters if you're interested. Images, uh, this is the markdown format for images where basically you put uh, the square brackets with an exclamation point and then in some parentheses next to it, you put wherever the location is. So for uh, all the stuff, you want to put it inside the images folder, which will be created for you inside your site. So if I go in here, I have images. All of this stuff, if I want to uh, access this folder or this image right here, for example, I would do images slash abstract dash landscape.jpg and then basically that would get copied across whenever we create the site. So that's how you use images for there. 
uh, different themes will have built-in support for different sections. So if you do end up using a different theme, just make sure you have the right sections that you want. Um, these are the type of section you can look into if you're interested. Um, but the main thing is what we're going to try is basically just go to your command line, open up a folder, just whatever folder you want, go ahead, say easy CV it's, and then put your name in there and you can either pick a theme or you can use default theme and just try messing around with, um, just filling in some information about yourself, just sort of like how you've been going through for, um, high school so far and how like projects, if you're have any of those, any information you really want to include, chuck it in there. And then next week, what we're going to do is we're going to show you how to actually host that site and get it up on the internet so you guys can see how that works. But for now, what we're going to do is give you guys a chance to try setting up your own site using ECCB. So we give you guys a chance to try that out. With that, uh, there's really actually a one size fits all solution. So ECCB is super handy because um, it's designed for individuals. So it's used for making stuff for basically a normal just like regular person sort of thing but that doesn't mean necessarily that it's good for everything right um <clears throat> for example if you need to actually access the files directly or if you need to be able to do some sort of a different sort of folder layout or you need to inject something sort of lower level um ECCB is not great for it situations like that there's something like hugo <clears throat> which is a really cool option uh it's really really fast it's designed to be used for like industry and so that's actually what we use for the usual connect website so all the source code for this is public if people are interested. Um, and essentially this system, instead of using YAML files, it uses TOML, but same principle. We have some variables in here and then content. And then we have, for example, like the blog. If I go ahead and take a look at on the Scorch page, if I go ahead and take a look at, well, let's just say this page for Scorch. If I go ahead and I went to the content here and then went down to where it says Scorch, I took a look, there's all of our sessions. So all the information that you're seeing for each of these sessions, like session zero, for example, here's all the information that is all available directly on that page. That's where it comes from. And that's what it's used to generate this. Um, and so same thing with the blog. Blog, we got all the stuff for the blog is inside here. So this scales up pretty well. Like this is exactly what we use for virtual Ignite. Um, and so <clears throat> this sort of stuff is really powerful because it means that for Shulk Ignite, we do not pay any hosting costs it doesn't cost anything to host this because everything gets turned into HTML files at the end. And then they get posted up on what's called GitHub pages, which we'll talk about next time. Um, and basically none of this costs any money for us to run this essentially, which is super handy. So uh, the reason why we use it for um, doing which looking at, like I said, it's ubiquitous, it's a huge community, tons of themes, uh, although we built our own theme and then it's fast, it's tested, lots of little level access. Uh, why we didn't use it here? it's quite a bit more complicated than ECCB is. ECCB has stuff included with it that lets you get up and running really quickly. Uh, Hugo does not. You have to kind of play around and mess around with stuff to learn how to use it. And also the templating language sucks. I can tell you I've had to use it for years. It's awful, but um, it works. That's the big thing is that it works. So um, yeah, so uh, she'll connect. So this is basically like running this locally to see how the site works. We just run a Hugo serve. And then we can see here, if I went to this in my browser, if I had the actual code available on my PC, if I went to a browser now and popped it open, we would see the Shulk Knight site as it was at that time when I was doing the development work. So that's how all of this stuff is built for Shulk Knight. Uh, another option is Astro, which is fully JavaScript. So if you're interested in looking at a system that uses JavaScript instead of Python for some reason, um, then Astro is a good option. Uh, this one actually does, I will say, have some really cool themes. If we go ahead, I think there is a themes option here. This one does have some actually pretty cool themes. So Astro is another good option if you want to use something else besides EasyCV or any of these systems. Basically, at the end of the day, use whatever's going to be best for you. That's the only thing that really matters is what's going to work for you and work for the people who you're working with when you're creating any of your sites. And so, so far, We've created websites, but nobody has been able to actually access them yet. Uh, so how do we actually access websites? That's what we're going to talk about next week. We can talk about how to get um, websites up and hosted and talk about how we actually access other people's websites. So what are the rules in place? And how does the browser actually talk to another person's website and get the information they need from their host to us and back and forth? And so the end of session exercise is going to be uh, this week. Better buy is what it's going to be called. And it's an e-commerce store that focuses on selling electronics. And basically, you're going to be in charge of building their website. And so it's going to be using a static site generator. And we can see here, we're going to build a products page, for example, where we have these cards. And we have the information about each of the products on those pages. And then level two is going to be creating an individual page for a specific product. So we're taking a look at like a phone or like a laptop or whatever, building out that template that we see for that page there. 
And then level three is going to be trying to create a shopping cart. So whenever we add something to a cart, we're going to try and add in some JavaScript that adds something to like a, a list in the back end or an array in the back end. And then basically when we go and click on the cart, uh, it's going to show us what all that stuff looks like in here. And so that's going to be the end of session exercise. Um, we're going to give you guys uh, the last eight minutes or so. Um, if you are interested to spend it with your mentors, to ask any questions that you have. And then uh, after that, you can go, or if you need to leave early, you can also leave early. Um, but yeah, thank you for coming. We're going to open up the breakout rooms again and give